Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Bo- and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Hi everybody. And uh, thank you, uh, Bob, for that warm introduction, and uh, to you, too. Uh, my- <laughs> Your husband's here somewhere, yeah. isn't he? <laughs> Good. I want to uh, I want to thank the committee for the opportunity and privilege of being here and taking part in your convention this weekend. Uh, and when I say that, I'm not saying it to sound nice, or I'm not saying it because I want you to like me. I'm saying it because I mean it from the bottom of my heart. I'm a guy that considers it a privilege to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I consider it a privilege to come here and, and, and be with you people. I'm sure there's those people who would say that I have a right to be a member of AA, that I it's my right to be here, and I, I suppose that's true. But I've always felt it's a privilege to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and pray to God I always do. So uh, I want to thank you uh, for the opportunity and being here. Um, it's been a wonderful time. I got here in the middle of the, the night last night and, and uh, got to see around town. This is a be- beautiful place, you, a facility you have for this. And uh, thank the committee for the uh, the bag of uh, goodies. They got a bag this big. They put my, well, I'm going to join Overeaters Anonymous when I get home. <laughs> And uh, for the warmth and uh, and hospitality, I, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, the Al Anon talk this afternoon, uh, Mary, and that was uh, really and truly wonderful. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the speakers. Uh, you're in. If you can just make it through the next 45 minutes, you're in for a good weekend. <laughs> <laughs> With Kat and, and, and Carl and, and Sandy isn't here yet, and Tim, and, and I'm looking forward to. It's kind of nice to be the Friday night guy and get get it over with, and 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 and, and enjoy the rest of the weekend. Uh, I, I want to thank the committee. I know that uh, I know you're not this selfish in New York, but in Canada we are, and it's very easy for me to come to conferences like this and and come here and, and enjoy speakers all weekend and the fellowship and and uh, a, a banquet and a dinner and dance and, and and get my car at the end of it and drive home and sometimes forget all the work that's been done on our behalf. You see, these things don't just happen. There has been people all year long getting to, together for committee meetings, taking time out of their lives and that, and there'll be people here after you and I have gone home on Sunday cleaning up and, and, and wrapping this thing up, all for, for you and I. And I really want to thank you for the work that your committee's done uh, on our behalf this weekend, for sure. And would, and would really too like to thank, you know, there's a lot of people and volunteers and stuff. There's people this weekend who will sit out at that registration desk all weekend long and not get to take in any of the stuff and, and be there working on that so that you and I can, can enjoy that. And, and I really think uh, very highly and appreciate the work they've done for us too that don't even get to come here, uh, very much. Uh, I'm a guy who, who got, uh, has always enjoyed listening to tapes in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've just, uh, still do from the, from day one. I love listening and I, and I, I really, such a tremendous tool for many of us to, to listen to, to the recovery stories and the process and that. And, uh, I really want to thank uh, Dick and the guys and that that travel all over the country, spend weekend after weekend and stuff, lugging this stuff around and that with the lives that you guys have touched uh, over so many years and stuff. And we really, really appreciate it. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I mean it. And Bob Canada is not really that far away. <laughs> <laughs> but some people in the United States, they think, I, I, this is, I was, uh, uh, where, where was I? somewhere, Can, I was in Kansas City not too long ago, about a month or more ago, and uh, I talked on the Sunday, and I didn't, I couldn't get out till a late night flight that night and stuff, and, and you, you who go to these things know this, boy, when these things end Sunday, it's like a ghost town in these places, <laughs> I, I just vanish, and... <clears throat> It, the hotel was just dead and almost eerie, but I was sitting in a little cafe having a bite to eat, and a lady came over and uh, tapped me on the shoulder. She said, you just talked at the, the meeting there. I said, yes, I did. 
She said, would would you join my husband and I for some lunch? We'd like to talk to you and stuff. I said, well, sure I will. And we talked about some stuff, and she was having some struggles with her family member. She had a boy who who was in and out and in bad, bad shape and stuff. He was just got out of jail again and that. And, and she ta- mentioned to me that they he was in jail for Christmas, and Christmas was a real family thing to them, and, and it was a very difficult Christmas for her. And she looked at me, and she was dead serious. She said to me, do they have Christmas in Canada? (laughs) I said, yeah, it started a couple years ago. Looks like it's going to catch on. So it's it's uh, again. I'm I'm happy to be here and want to thank the me. I love coming to the United States of America. I love the United States of America with all my heart. Always have, always, always have a great, great, warm spot in my heart for your country. And the thing that touches my heart so much about your country is your patriotism. You are just an incredible, credible country, and I want to thank you so much for being a neighbor and a friend to our country and my country. And I really, really mean that. <clears throat> I better get to talking here, because I know the important part of this weekend's coming up for the dance is starting, isn't it? <laughs> I, uh, I'm, as I said, I'm happy to be here. Uh, alcoholics, I'm happy to get where I'm going, because alcoholics don't always get where they're going. <laughs> huh? Now, especially when I was a drinking alcoholic, I most often didn't get where I was going, but even sometimes sober, I don't get where I'm going. And I'll tell you what I mean. I was, I was going to talk, uh, at a, well, I gotta tell you, uh, there was a time in my life that I wasn't allowed in the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> Let me add, nor should I be. They said to me, we have enough people like you here already. We don't need to import them. <laughs> So even in sobriety, I was allowed here, but a number of years ago, I went and, uh, and, uh, I applied for a, for a waiver. Uh, to, to the United States Department of Justice that would allow me to come in the United States of America. And I got this, and I have it. It's right up my my room right now. It's a piece of paper. It's a beautiful thing. And it says that I'm allowed to come to the United States of America on humanitarian grounds. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that means. <laughs> but I come, and, and when I come to the United States, I have to show that every time I come into this country. And that. Well, anyway, I was going to a conference in Illinois a number of years before back now a while ago and uh when, when when i don't know about you but from time to time i can misplace things so when i got that waiver i made 25 copies of it <laughs> just in case and i was going to illinois to a conference and i get up and i always like to fly generally early on the friday morning and i get up first thing friday morning real early and i was going to be heading out and i said to my wife i said deb where's my waiver she said what she, like she should know where my waiver is <laughs> She said, I don't know, it's wherever you put it. I said, no, 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 you've put it somewhere, it's missing. (laughs) She said, I didn't put it anywhere. She said, listen, you got to get going, you got to catch that flight. Take one of those photocopies, I'll find the original when you're gone. So I got that, and I got packed up, I headed for the airport, and and I got to the airport, and... and Please don't misunderstand me. Our, our border uh, patrol and that do a wonderful job protecting our borders and our countries. But I think when those guys go to custom school, they teach them how not to smile. Huh? They are not friendly bunch sometimes there. So I'm going to this thing, and, and when I come to the United States of America, they, want, they don't want to know that I'm going to New York. They want an address, and I forgot to get the address. So anyway, I go up, and there was a young guy there. He wasn't a very happy-looking guy. And I, and I walked up, and I, I gave him my stuff, and I gave him the waiver. And he looked at the waiver. He says to me, he says, what are you, a criminal? <laughs> I said, well, perhaps you could have said that at one time. <laughs> he, he, sa- he looked at this. He says to me, this is a photocopy. I said, yes, I keep the original at home for safekeeping. Lies just fall out of my mouth. <laughs> He said, you can't travel on a waiver. He said, you have your I-94 form, and I had the form. I pulled it out. He says, that's the wrong form. I'm thinking, oh, no. He says, you got to go over there, fill out this other form, and you're going to have to go talk to somebody about this photocopy. You can't travel on a photocopy. Well, I think I'm not going to the United States today. But I go over, I fill out that form, and I'm an alcoholic, smart thinking. And I watched, and I waited till he had somebody in his line, and then I went over to the other line. <laughs> 
And I'm, I'm, I'm going through the line and I give the guy all the stuff and that. And he looked at that. He, he asked me, you know, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Illinois. He said, what are you going there for? I said, I'm going to talk at a convention, Alcoholics Anonymous. He said, what address are you staying at? I went, oh. I said, uh, I don't know. He said, you don't know where you're going? <laughs> I said, well, I said, no, but I said, somebody's going to pick me up at the airport and take me there. He said to me, who's picking you up? (laughs) I said, well, I don't know. (laughs) He said, let me get this straight. Somebody you don't know is picking you up, taking you somewhere you don't know where you're going. I said, yeah. He says to me, he said, what did you say you're going there for again? I said, well, I'm going to talk at a, at a conference, Alcoholics Anonymous. He says to me, what are you going to talk about? And before I could answer him, he looked at me and says, hold it. He said, you don't know. (laughs) So I'm happy to be here tonight. (laughs) Happy to be here. I, uh, I'm, I'm one of those alcoholics. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous on September the 21st, 1989, and I haven't had to have a drink since my first meeting. Now, I know that's not everybody's case. Uh, a lot of people come to Alcoholics Anonymous and struggle here. A lot of people return to drinking. Some people come in and out. It's the nature of the beast. But I'm one of those people that came here and, and did some of the things I was told to do, and I haven't, I haven't had to have a drink since then. And I'm one of those alcoholics as well that I'm very, very fortunate. I've liked Alcoholics Anonymous since the first meeting. I just really have. I know that's not everybody's case again. I hear people, they were not happy about it. They didn't like this. They didn't like that. I just like coming. I was very, very fortunate that I love conferences. I like my group. I like meetings. I like service days, assemblies. I've liked everything about it. I've been very, very fortunate. So I have no regrets since coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. I really do. Well, I only have one, Dick, just one. And that is that I didn't get to drink with some of you. Huh? <laughs> Haven't you ever thought that? Haven't you ever met people at an AA and think, geez, I'd like to have done a little drinking with that fellow? Huh? <laughs> I was in a thing in, in Sault Ste. Marie on the, on the American-Canadian border in northern Ontario. I went there for, for, a, for a conference and stuff to talk. And I get up on the Saturday morning, and I went out to get some breakfast. I picked up the local paper to, uh, to read about what was going on in the community. I like to know a little bit about the place I've been invited to come to. And there on the front page of the paper was this article, and there was a fellow. They had arrested him coming across the American-Canadian border, drunk, on a stolen street sweeper. (laughs) And my immediate thought was, I'd like to have done a little drinking with him. (laughs) And I knew at that moment, I intuitively knew at that moment, he was one of those alcoholics that we hear talked about in Alcoholics Anonymous with the keen alcoholic mind. I don't know if you have that down here in New York, but we have it at home. I just was at a meeting a while ago, a guy, good AA fellow I know, good AA worker, and he was talking, and he was up there dead, dead serious, and he said, you know, when alcoholics sober up, they're brighter than the average person. If there's anybody here tonight who's new, and I sure hope there is, I just want to point out one thing to you. Whenever you hear about the keen alcoholic mind, it will always be from an alcoholic. <laughs> always. <laughs> we will not hear about the keen alcoholic mind at the al meeting, that's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I uh, get going here. We're not a glum lot, are we? Uh, we aren't. Uh, the laughter, the laughter. Isn't it incredible? I sometimes sit here and I think of that. When we look around this room and that tonight and stuff, we think about the, the, the devastation that has happened. 
We think about the destruction in the lives, in our lives, in family members, in the people that we go through like a train wreck. And, and all of that stuff, all of that suffering, all of that pain, you think of all of that with a group like this together. Devastating, isn't it? And yet here we sit tonight laughing and together and, and just an incredible deal. This is a powerful thing we've, we've tapped into, isn't it? Powerful thing. I was, uh, I was 25 years old and, um, my wife, whom I love very much, had uh, had thrown me out of our home. I, I had a new address uh, every night. I lived in stairwells in apartment buildings in downtown Toronto. I just went from building to building. And at night, I would be under that stairwell. In the daytime, I would be like a rat in a sewer, out on those streets looking to scam, looking to steal, looking to get what I needed to get. You'll hear people in Alcoholics Anonymous talk about AA luggage, matching green garbage bags. Huh. Huh? I didn't have any AA luggage. Had the clothes on my back. Still had an ultra suede jacket, though. Going to be cool at any expense. Huh? If I was any cooler, I'd have froze to death. I'm 25 years old. I'm living in stairwells. I got the clothes on my back, and nobody wants anything more to do with me. And let me add, nor should they. Nor should they. Because you see, alcoholics of my type are users and takers. We use and we take from everybody that we come in contact with. Now, it doesn't always appear that way because, see, I'm a people pleaser. I want people to like me. I'm the guy in the bar buying drinks for everybody, passing the bag around, everybody's buddy, huh? I'll tell you tonight the only reason I ever did anything for anyone was so you'd like me. Not because I care about you. I am a user and I'm a taker. And let me tell you who I use and take from most. It's the people who love me. It's my own family. It's the people who care about me most. Because, see, they can't stop giving. They keep trying. One more time. One more detox. One more treatment center. One more time. This time might be the time. And I use and I take until eventually the very people that love me most have to push me away. Because we break their hearts and they can't take it anymore. And that's where I was. There wasn't anybody walking the face of this earth who would accept a collect telephone call from me. And I was 25 years old. I was in the east end of Toronto one night. I was all jacked up and, as I just said, nowhere to go. And uh, my wife and I had owned a home in what they call the beaches of Toronto down near the lake. And we had a screened-in porch with a couple wicker couches on it. And I thought, I'm going to slip into that porch and grab a couple hours and get out before morning. Well, I passed out. And I woke up to one of these. And I opened my eyes and I looked and there was that little gal. And I'll tell you, I loved her. And she looked at me with disgust and pity. And she said, Butch, you're a useless piece of scum. And you are never going to change. And if you care anything about me whatsoever, you will get up and get out of here. And please don't ever come back because I can't stand to look at you. And I get up and I left there and I went down, just down what they call in Toronto the boardwalk, down on the lakefront like a park. And it was July, August, I don't know, but it was hot. It was hot and I was sick and hung over and heart sick. And I went down there and I was sitting on a park bench and I looked over where you guys are and there was another bench and there was a little boy, five or six years old, sitting there eating a popsicle. And I looked over at the little boy and you know what I thought to myself? Wish I had a dime for a popsicle. The big shot, huh? The guy buying drinks for everybody in the bar. The big dope dealer. Everybody's friend sitting on a bench wishing he had a dime for a popsicle. And here's the thought that I had at that moment. I knew that's as good as my life was ever going to be. Now, I have always been a talker. I've always been a schemer and a scammer. I knew I'd hustle something. I'd get some money somewhere. I'd, I'd put something together. But I knew at that moment that's where I was going to end back up every single time. And I was 25 years old. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous when I was 33. I had eight more years on those streets. And I won't bore you with the details. Because you all know it never gets better. It always gets worse. And I had eight more years. And I came to Alcoholics Anonymous when I was 33. And I joined a group and I got a sponsor. And I did the things that I was told to do. You know where I was last summer? Huh? I was in Rome, Italy. Standing in the Sistine Chapel looking at the paintings of Michelangelo from 500 years before with my wife beside me, and the tears started to pour down my face. And I thought of that 25-year-old kid sitting on a park bench wishing he had a dime for a popsicle. It is a long way from a park bench in Toronto to the Sistine Chapel in Rome. Huh? It is a long way from where you or I were 
the dredges of society, when nobody else, when our own families didn't want anything more to do with us. And yet here we sit tonight, contributing members of, of, of society with our families rebuilt, our lives rebuilt. Huh? It's an incredible, credible deal, isn't it? How does that happen? Because it's not supposed to. And you and I know it only happens one way and one way only. And that is through the grace of God through the grace of God that you and I have been introduced to through the 12 Steps Alcoholics Anonymous and a fellowship called Alcoholics Anonymous. We are so richly, richly blessed, aren't we? And you want to believe I'm happy to be here with you this weekend. That is for sure. I uh, I, I like drinking. <laughs> Stuck on. I don't know about you, but I like... I, I think people in Alcoholics Anonymous say it's sacrilegious to say you like drinking, for God's sakes. Huh? I hear people in these meetings stab here say things like, drinking took me places I didn't want to go. <laughs> Doing things I didn't want to do. With people I didn't want to be with. And I'm thinking to myself, why did you bother? <laughs> huh? I wanted to be with those people in those places doing those things. I loved that lifestyle. I loved it. The seedier, the better. I loved it. I loved to drink. I started to drink at an early age. I hear people in Alcoholics Anonymous talk about dysfunctional families. Was my family dysfunctional? I don't know. Let me just tell you it wasn't the Cleaver residence around my home. <laughs> there was lots of parties in my home. There was lots of drinking in my home from the time I was a young child. All the time there'd be parties on the weekend. And as a little boy, they'd let me play bartender. And I could take them, take them beers and, and take away the empties, and they'd let me have swigs. And they'd say, isn't he cute? <laughs> and I love that attention. So I started to drink when I was four years old. Now, I wasn't a daily drinker when I was four. <laughs> My allowance wouldn't allow it. <laughs> I actively sought out alcohol the first time. I don't know, I was 12 or 13 years old. I got a guy to go into a liquor store, get a couple bottles of wine. I was going to be a wine connoisseur. <laughs> Two bottles of Ed we call Four Aces. I think it's kind of like your Thunderbird or something. <laughs> huh? And I'll tell you, any wine I ever drank had a cap, not a cork. <laughs> huh? We drank that wine, got drunk, puked, and passed out, and that was the end of my social drinking. It was all downhill from there. <clears throat> I hear people in Alcoholics Anonymous say things like, you've maybe heard this in discussion. I guess I came to AA hoping to learn how to drink socially. Huh? I came to Alcoholics Anonymous hoping Alcoholics Anonymous is going to teach me to become a social drinker. I want to tell you tonight, I didn't want to be a social drinker when I drank. I don't want to be a social drinker tonight. I don't particularly like social drinkers. Huh? <laughs> I find them weird. Weird. You ever watch a social drinker drink? Huh? They let the ice melt in their glass. That's sick. That's alcohol abuse. <laughs> You ever drink with a social drinker? Huh? That's enough to make you puke, isn't it? You're having a few scoots. Would you like another one? Oh, no, thanks. I'm starting to feel it. Really? I thought that's when you put it in overdrive. Huh? Don't identify. I don't identify with closet alcoholics. You know those people that get the bottle, go in, lock the door, put on the country western music. Doesn't mean they're not alcoholic, just drank differently than me. I'm a bar room drinker. Oh, ho, 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 I love those bars. Huh? I like opening the door to a bar. That smoke would billow out. Huh? That smoke filled, that urine smelling. Huh? <laughs> Upholstered sewers is where I drink. <laughs> I love those places. I like neon. I, I like neon when I was drinking. I still like it. That's why I stay out of casinos. They're not a good place for guys like me. And I got to tell you, I thank God I never tried to get sober in the United States of America. I don't think it ever made it. Oh, boy, I love drinking here, Dick. I loved it. You guys, we don't have as many at home, but I love those places. I call them juke joints. You know those divey little joints you see? Those I saw one down to Farmer's Tavern I saw today. Oh, oh man. <laughs> I spotted that place. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's my kind of place. I'll dive you little joints with a neon sign in the window says cocktails. Oh. 
Yeah, I love it. I was on my way to an AA thing in Pennsylvania a number of years ago. Deb and I were driving, and I'm driving through this little town in the middle of nowhere, and, 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 and I'm going down the main street, this little town. I hammer on the brakes to my car. I'm backing the car up. She said, Butch, what are you doing? I said, i got to see this again. <laughs> and there it was, this divey little joint with a neon sign. said, stop for one, stay till one. <laughs> <laughs> If I'd have been drinking, I'd have had that tattooed on me. <laughs> Absolute work of art. Anyway, I, that's, that was my drinking and stuff, and I love that, and I'm not going to talk any more about my drinking tonight other than to very quickly share with you what drinking does to and for an alcoholic of my type. I think it's important that I share with you about my drinking for the purpose of identification. That's why we talk about our drinking, so one alcoholic can identify with another alcoholic. That is the greatest tool that we have in Alcoholics Anonymous is identification. That's why one alcoholic can help another alcoholic. That's why Alcoholics Anonymous works for alcoholics and other programs work for other things. We need to have that identification. We just need to have that. So I just want to very quickly share with you what drinking does to and for an alcoholic of my type. I'm the type of alcoholic, and when I look back through my life, I wasn't thinking these things at the time, but I see them today as I went back through an inventory. You helped me to see these things, because when I was drinking, I wasn't thinking about nothing. I was just drinking. But as I look back today, I can remember from the time I was a young kid in school, a little boy, a nine or ten years old, <clears throat> and I'd be in that classroom, and the teacher, she'd ask a question, and she'd start looking around that classroom to see who she was going to ask to answer the question. And my head goes down like this. Oh, don't let her ask me. Please don't let her ask. Because I know if she makes eye contact with me, she's asking me to answer the question, and I don't want to answer the question. It doesn't even matter if I know the answer to the question, I don't want to answer the question. And when I went to school, we used to have to do a book report. I don't know if you do that here. Get up in front of the whole classroom full of kids. Oh, no good. No, no good. I get up in the morning, I'd say, Ma, I've been puking all night. I can't go to school today. Ma, I'm too sick to go. Please don't make me go today. Because I want to tell you something. I would be absolutely terrified, terrified at the thought of getting out of that classroom full of kids. I can remember I'd get on these little jags every now and then where I've said I've quit drinking, you know, no more drinking, and I'd have to go to a wedding. Ever go to a wedding sober? That is a bad deal. <laughs> that is a bad deal for me. I would be at that church sweating, thinking about that dance that was going to happen in three hours. I'm back at that wedding reception now, and I don't have a drink or anything in me, and I'm telling you something. My hands are sweaty. I got a knot in the pit of my stomach, and I feel awkward and out of place, and I got to do one of two things. I got to get over to that bar and get a couple drinks into me, or I got to get out of there because I can't stand the way I feel. Every decision I ever made in my life was based on fear. Huh? Where I went, what I did. Want to go over with these guys and do that? I said, I'm not going with those goofs. You want to know what the truth was? I felt uncomfortable there. I felt awkward there. All of my decisions were made based on a comfort level. Absolutely afraid of everything. And here is the killer of alcoholics. I didn't even know I was afraid. Didn't even know. We talk an awful lot in meetings that I go to, discussion meetings tonight. Let's discuss resentments. <laughs> I prefer to call it hate. <laughs> I know you're not that sick in New York, but in Canada we are. Hate. I'm the type of alcoholic I would be out driving in my car, and I'm, on the, I'm at a red light, and I'm on the nod by now, and that light would turn green, and the guy behind me would lay on his horn. Ho, oh, oh. ho. I almost go through the roof of my car. I want to get out of my car, go back there, open the door, drag him out by the throat, take a crowbar, and crack his skull wide open. Now, I know you spiritual giants never thought thoughts like that, but I do. Absolute hate. I pick up a plate of food, I heave it across the room and smash it against the wall. Hate. My sponsor used to call it soul sickness. Gangrene of the spirit. Just angry. And I'll tell you who takes the brunt of my anger. It's the people who love me. It happens behind closed doors. Because, see, I'm a people pleaser. I want to be the guy in the bar, everybody's buddy, everybody's friend. So you don't display that rage out there. You keep it for behind closed doors. And I'm going to tell you that I have a white rage inside of me that would erupt every now and then that I didn't have five seconds before and I didn't have five seconds after. But I swear to you, every now and then there would be a rage that would explode that I would do things and say things that I didn't want to do and I had absolutely no control over. None. Lonely. 
I was 25 years old. I was standing at a subway platform at Young and Bloor in downtown Toronto on a Friday night, all jacked up, and a train pulled up and the doors opened and a young couple my age got off that train holding hands and they walked off into the night laughing and smiling. And I felt an emptiness and a loneliness like I couldn't describe. And you know what I thought to myself? Why can't I be like those people? Why can't I just be like other people? Why is all the trouble got to keep happening? All the stuff got to keep... I just like to be like other people. I remember walking through a nice residential area on a warm summer's night, just getting dark out, and I'd walk down the street, the nice homes and that, and I'd see the lights would be on and the families would be in there, and I'd look at that, and God, I'd feel sad. Sad. Why can't I just have a nice home and a family like other people? Why is all this trouble got to keep happening? From as long as I can ever remember, I was restless, irritable, and discontented. If I was drinking at this bar, I'd say, drink up, let's go over to the other bar. If we're at this party, I'd say, come on, let's go over to that party. If I had this job, I should have that job. Never quite right. Never quite right. I don't know what it was like for you, but I'll tell you, I'd get one of those double vodkas, and it was just like this. I don't know if you remember that feeling or not. It was just like this. I get goosebumps when I do that. I got I did that one night in a meeting, two guys get up and left. <laughs> they remembered the feeling. <clears throat> I'll tell you, I'd have a couple of those double vodkas and let me tell you something, those sweaty hands were gone. That knot in my stomach vanished, that rage would subside, that loneliness went away, and I would walk into that wedding like I own the joint. Huh? And I am moving and grooving. And I'm talking to the ladies, and I'm sitting around with my buddies, and we're drinking and carrying on. And at that moment, everything in my life is absolutely perfect, and my perception of reality changes. And that's what makes me alcoholic. Huh? And I'd have two or three of those vodkas, and I would get an immediate sense of ease and comfort. And that's why I drink. But I'm alcoholic. I'd start drinking. I couldn't stop. I'd drink 60 ounces of vodka, and I'd end up, I'd go and smash up a car. I'd go out after work for a few beers with my buddies. I'd go on a four-day bender. I'd get fired from my job. I'd tell my wife I'm going out for a loaf of bread. I run into Bob. I'm gone for three weeks. Now my wife's leaving me. Now I'm out there drinking, carrying on, and I don't want to stop. I don't have any job. I don't have any money, so I'm stealing yours. Now I'm going to jail. And what everybody focused on in my life was the crash cars, the broken marriages, lost jobs, going to jail. We looked at drinking. We never looked at alcoholism. And people told me from the time I was 18 years old, Butch, if you'd just quit drinking and sticking needles in your arms, kid, you'd be all right. And there was times I wasn't drinking, and guess what? I wasn't all right. As a matter of fact, I'm crazier sober than I was when I drank. But that's what we focused on. I would love to stand up here tonight and tell you I woke up one morning, HFC was dying to lend me money. (laughs) Work was thinking of promoting me. And my wife was sending me flowers. And I thought to myself, I think I'll join Alcoholics Anonymous today. huh? Every now and then I hear some moron from the front of one of these rooms say things like, if you're not here for the right reasons, you might as well drink. And every now and then, I'd like to get the tire iron back out. Huh? The, the right reasons? Did you come to Alcoholics Anonymous for the right reasons? I came to Alcoholics because I had nowhere else to go. One more time, my back was up against the wall. My boss called me into work on a Tuesday. He said, but you're a very good worker. I said, well, thank you. He said, but you're not here much. <laughs> <laughs> I felt he was a little picky. <laughs> He said, you think you might have a problem with alcohol? I said, no, but I know what the problem is. He said, maybe you'd share that with me. I said, it's my health. He said, really? I said, now, granted, my poor health may have something to do with my drinking. I'm going to quit drinking. My health's going to get better, and everyone's going to be okay. He said, do you think you might need some help quitting drinking? I said, no, I'm just going to quit. Got up and left his office. Was to find out later his wife had been a member of Alcoholics Anonymous for a number of years. Can you imagine the chuckle he had as I left? Huh? <laughs> He's just going to (laughs) quit. That was Tuesday. I woke up Thursday in another hotel room in another town drunk. I didn't keep him waiting long. And for whatever the reason, I knew the jig was up this time. I knew I was in. I'd used all the lies. Huh? Alcoholics are liars. I don't know what that's about. I'd sooner lie when the truth would serve me better. My wife would say to me, but you've been gone from work for a week. What are you going to tell them? I said, I don't know. I'll wait till they ask. (laughs) I don't have to think about it. I'm the type of alcoholic. I go out. I go out all by myself and play golf by myself. 
and cheat on the scorecard. <laughs> I do. <laughs> that's, that's not the best part. I look at the scorecard at the end and go, good game, Butch. Good game. <clears throat> I can't differentiate the truth from the false. I'm a liar. So I know I'm in trouble. I got to come up with something good this time. So I had a few tequilas. I turned my mind to it. I thought, what am I going to tell him? And it came to me. I'm going to tell him I'm alcoholic and I'm going to go to AA. And that's how I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And if there's anybody here tonight who's new, and again, I sure hope there is, we couldn't care less why you're here. We couldn't care less. We're just glad to see you. We're just glad to see you. And maybe, just maybe by the grace of God, something someone will say, something you'll hear, something you'll read, and the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous can happen in your life, and you can go on to live a happy and useful life like so many of these men and women have been able to do. Just keep coming, because we're glad to see you. And I started coming to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And as I mentioned earlier, I've been a blessed man since the day I came here. I have a deep, deep love in my heart for the old timers. A deep love. Men and women who've been coming for 20 and 30 and 40 years. Who've made sacrifices and commitments to Alcoholics Anonymous so would be here for people like you and I. I love them from the bottom of my heart. And if you're new to Alcoholics Anonymous, I would urge you, to get close to these men and women and learn from their experience because we're not going to have them with us forever. And I had some giants come into my life. I've heard people say in Alcoholics Anonymous, you should never put anyone on a pedestal. Well, you do what you need to do. But I'm going to tell you something. I have some people on pedestals, some giants, giants. Never for a moment have I lost sight of their humanities. Do you want to know the greatest gift my sponsor ever gave me? My sponsor died two years ago with 46 years in Alcoholics Anonymous. Do you want to know the greatest gift my sponsor, Bobby Dobson, ever gave me? It wasn't some profound, wise statement. He allowed me to see his humanities. He allowed me to see his warts. He allowed me to see him make mistakes. Because let me tell you something. If he didn't, I would never measure up. We are much more brothers and sisters in our defects than we are in our virtues, aren't we? <laughs> so I started coming to meetings and stuff and, and, and had some wonderful people come into my life. And I got to tell you that I have been treated with nothing but kindness and respect and love and dignity since the day I came to Alcoholics Anonymous up to and including tonight. I am the beneficiary of your love and kind acts and, and, and all the way through. But I'll tell you, I am real grateful that the men and women who came into my life cared a lot more about me getting well than they did me liking them. And they told me the truth. They told me the truth. They told me Butch Alcoholics Anonymous is about action. It's about doing. It's about, it's about change here. And those changes are small and they, and they, and they start to grow and stuff. And they helped me to understand what my problem was. Cause I don't know about you, but I'll tell you, I had no idea. I had been told what my problem was. I had been told all my, since I was 18 years old, Butch, if you just quit drinking, you'll be okay. My parents told me, doctors told me, psychiatrists told me, police told me, courts told me, everybody told me, Butch, just quit drinking, you'll be okay. But you see, I didn't have a clue. Never had a clue what the problem was. You were the first people that told me. I go to a detox at home on Mondays. I'll be there Monday, 2 o'clock. It's not my job. I don't do it because I'm some saint. It's the way I've been taught. I am the product of strong sponsorship, and I believe in strong sponsorship. I believe that sponsorship is the greatest tool that we have in Alcoholics Anonymous to guide us through these steps and towards recovery. And I believe without strong sponsorship, uh, I'll never, ever make it. So I go there because it's the way I've been taught. And I'll go there. I do it every, and I'll go there Monday, and I'll say maybe a dozen guys and gals. I'll say to those guys and gals, anybody here ever lose a job because of their drinking? Sort of a goofy question to ask an alky, huh? <laughs> Anybody here ever get in trouble with the law because of their drinking or drugging? Huh? Anybody here ever have their family split up because of their drinking? Anybody here ever hurt people that they love and care about because of their drinking? Anybody here ever hurt themselves because of their drinking? Huh? And I look at those guys and gals and I say to them, I say, I want to ask you a question. Because when I ask that question, you ever see those cars with the little doggy in the back window, the head bobs up and down? Huh? Well, that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at a dozen heads going up and down. <clears throat> and I say to those guys and gals, I say, I want to ask you a question. Knowing that, 
knowing everything that drinking has done in your life time and time again, knowing the people that you've hurt that you love, knowing the devastation that it's caused in your life, knowing all that, can you tell me why you would go back and do it again? And I look at the blankest looking faces you have ever seen in your life. And I say to those guys and gals, if you're an alcoholic of my type, your answer to that question is exactly the same answer that I had when my mom and dad sat in a prison visiting room when I was 17 years old and the tears coming down their face saying, Butch, why? Why again? You promised there would be no more trouble. It's exactly the same answer that I had when my wife sat at a kitchen table with me and the tears streaming down her face saying, Butch, you promised me. Just last week you promised there would be no more drinking. Why? And I'd look at those people, and it was the only truth coming out of my mouth because I'm a liar. And you know what I said to those people? I don't know. I don't know. And that was the absolute truth. I never had a clue what my problem was. You were the first people that told me. You said, what's drinking's not your problem. It's your solution. How you feel when you're sober is your problem. You are restless, irritable, and discontent, and you can't stand feeling that way, and you have to drink again. It is the nature of the illness. I will become so irritable at one point, I have to do one of two things, blow my brains out or drink again. And most of us drink again. Never had a clue. You told me that selfishness and self-centeredness was the root of my problem. And from that selfishness and self-centeredness come a hundred forms of fear and all my resentments. Never had a clue. Never had a clue. You told me that lack of power, that's my dilemma. I don't have, I don't, I've lost the power of choice. I hear these commercials and stuff and people, these videos and that, they say, oh, just say no. <clears throat> really? Just say no. Huh? If I could just say no, you'd have a different talker tonight. You told me I had lost the power of choice. I don't have a choice whether I drink or not. Never had a clue. And you told me I had to be rid of this selfishness and self-centeredness or I would never stay sober and it would kill me. And you told me Alcoholics Anonymous is about change. It's about taking some actions in our life and we start to change. It's not about not drinking. We presume you're not drinking when you've come here. And you told me those changes were small and they start to grow as time goes on. You taught me the basic things. You, you told me to come to, to come to meetings early and go to the washroom and get a coffee and sit down and be quiet. Maybe you don't want to listen to what's going on in that meeting, Butch, but maybe that couple sitting there would like to. And for once in your life, why don't you think of someone else other than yourself? It was true. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd been on the street since I was 13 years old. I couldn't say a full sentence without four-letter words in it. It's the way I talked. I didn't know any different. And nobody embarrassed me in a meeting. Nobody centered me out or put me down. But you took me aside after with love. And you said to me, Butch, this isn't some juke joint bar room you're sitting in now. This is Alcoholics Anonymous here. This is a classy organization of ladies and gentlemen, and we don't talk that way in AA. Maybe that language doesn't bother you, but maybe it bothers that couple sitting there. And for once in your life, Butch, why don't you think of someone else? It was true. And the changes started. And you started to take me through this process. You know, and you told me that, that, that what we have here is a set of principles that are spiritual in their nature. And if I would practice them as a way of life, would remove the obsession for me to drink and allow me to live happily and usefully whole. Not if I sit around talking about them, sitting around discussing them, sitting around analyzing them, but if I would practice them as a way of life. It's about action, Butch. It's about change. And I never, ever had a clue. You told me that what we have here is we, we practice these things. And some days I do better than others. But you told me there was one thing that I had to do 100%, and that was that first step. That I had to admit to my innermost self, not here, but in the depth of my soul, that I am alcoholic and I am powerless over alcohol and my life's become unmanageable. Because I'm going to tell you something. If I don't believe in the depth of my soul that my life depends on taking these actions, if I don't believe that right here, I'm going to tell you something. The minute my life starts getting better, I will stop taking the actions. I will stop taking the actions. Because the actions that are required for sobriety here go totally opposite to the entire way I'd lived 33 years of my life. I'm a user and I'm a taker. And Alcoholics Anonymous is about giving. 
And if I don't believe my life depends on it, I will stop giving. The moment I start getting a few dollars in my pocket, another meaningful relationship happening, and things start going good, I'll stop taking the actions. And that's what you told me this thing was about. And you took me through this process. You know, you took me through this process, and, and I came to believe. And I came to believe by watching you people. I came to believe by the kind acts that you did for me. I came to believe by seeing you. And that belief has changed over time and grown. But that was all that was required for the start. That was all that was required. I didn't have to fully understand. I just had to believe. I just had to believe in something. And I made a decision that I was willing to do anything you people told me I had to do. Anything. And, 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 and that has grown and stuff. And you then took me through that process. And I'm not going to go through that tonight. I know you want to do some dancing. <laughs> but you took me through the inventory. You helped me to see the things that were wrong. You see, I didn't do that and go, my, 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 but you haven't been a very nice boy. I knew I was a lying, cheating thief. That was not news to me. But I'll tell you something. When you're a people pleaser like I am, you have no idea how full of rage and resentment you really are. When you're trying to be a tough guy out in the streets, you have no idea that your entire life is run on fear and all those things you do are based on those defects of character. I never had a clue. I didn't have a clue what my defect. I knew I was a thief and cheat, but I had no idea the things that were keeping me from the sunshine and the spirit. Not a clue. And you helped me see those things in an inventory. And then you told me that that next step was what separates the men from the boys. And that's not a sexist statement, but I knew it was important. And you told me that that is the point, Butch, where you're really ready to start to change. Are you really willing to let go of all those ideas and to really start changing? Because if I'm not, it's only a matter of time before I drink again. And I had to start to make, make restitution and make amends. And I believe that our program is a character-building process. I believe that through a series of actions, we start changing. And that process, I believe that recovery is a process the same way I believe relapse is a process. I hear people all the time saying, oh, Harry had a slip. I guess Harry just had a slip. Really? Really? You show me an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous who belongs to a group who has a sponsor and is working with other alcoholics, practicing and doing these steps, just popped in for a rum and coke? Huh? <laughs> I don't buy it. I don't. We slip long before we take the drink. The slip happens long before the drink does, huh? It really, so I hear that all the time. Got to get some balance in my life. When I hear that, I know you want to stop doing the actions that you were doing. That's what that means. And you told me I had to continue to take inventory. Important thing the longer I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous. Real important. Because I don't know about you, but I'm going to tell you, sometimes the longer I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous, the harder it is for me to be truthful with you. Sometimes the longer I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous, the harder it is for me to come to you and tell you I'm dying inside and I don't know what to do. Because I want you to think I have it all together. Huh? I've listened to people debate in meetings for an hour whether they were recovered or recovering. Smoke starts coming out my ears, for God's sakes. <laughs> Semantics. Huh? I'll tell you what you showed me in the book. You showed me the book where you said it is easy to let up in the spiritual program of action and to rest on our laurels. And if we do, we're headed for trouble because we are not cured of alcoholism. What I have is a daily reprieve that's contingent upon the maintenance of my spiritual condition. And my spiritual condition is maintained here with you in Alcoholics Anonymous doing what I'm doing today. You see, I cannot stay sober because I used to be a GSR. I cannot stay sober because I used to go to a detox. I cannot stay sober because I used to make coffee at my home group. I have to stay sober by what I'm doing today. And when I stop taking that action, uh, well, let me, if I stop taking that action tomorrow, am I going to be drunk on Friday? I don't think so. But I'll tell you what happens to an alcoholic of my type when I stop taking the action. I so very slowly and so very subtly start becoming restless, irritable, and discontent. And if you think restless, irritable, and discontent is bad when you're drinking, try it sober. <laughs> and eventually, I'll drink again. And you told me I had to improve that conscious contact with God. Huh? If my problem is a conscious separation, it only makes sense that the so solution is a conscious contact. And I don't know about you, but I'll tell you that my whole life, I never, I, I wasn't, uh, I didn't disbelieve. I didn't really, just ne didn't mean anything to me. But I, I believed in a God, I guess. And the God I believed in was some guy up, way up somewhere in the sky in heaven. And he, he looked down on all the people. And if you were good, he did good things for you. And if he were bad, he did bad things for you. And that's what God was. Now, if God's way up there in the sky and I'm down here, 
Have you heard more of a conscious separation than that in your life? Huh? Totally separated. You told me the great reality for me was that deep down inside of every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. That the great reality for us is that our Creator has entered into our hearts in a way that's indeed miraculous. And that that power is real. It is real. Uh, Marion talked so well about it today. There's a big difference between belief and faith. Big, big difference for me. And I have to improve that conscious contact because I can't stay sober on last year's spiritual experience any more than I can stay sober on last year's work. It's about what I'm doing today. And that's why I have to do that on a daily basis and continue that. And the great paradox of Alcoholics Anonymous, you told me if I want to keep it, i got to give it away. Huh? You showed me in our book where it says nothing will ensure us immunity from drinking like intensive work with other alcoholics. When all else fails, this works. You told me that unless I continue to enlarge and perfect on my spiritual life through selfless acts and helping others, I will surely drink when I hit those certain low spots. That's how I grow spiritually. I don't grow spiritually by sitting around humming. I don't grow spiritually by sitting around reading. I grow spiritually by trying to be of service to you. That's how I grow spiritually. And if I want to keep it, i got to give it away. We've been richly blessed, haven't we? So richly blessed. And if after everything we've been given, after everything, the good life we've been given, if that wasn't enough, you and I are then given the ability to maybe go out and make a difference in someone else's life. You see, you and I change people's lives. That's not an ego statement. That's a statement of gratitude. We can make a difference in someone else's life. That is an incredible thing. Incredible thing. It says in our book, I love this. I'm going to wrap this up soon. It says in our book that alcoholics laugh at sometimes seemingly tragic situations. Have you ever wondered or thought to yourself, I don't know, here you have birthdays and that, whatever you call it here, give a cake or whatever you do, and, and uh, you maybe some family members come, some friends come, never been to AA, don't know anything about AA at all. Have you ever wondered sometimes that some of those people leave thinking, huh? Some monkey like me gets up here and says things like, yes, I bought a brand new Cadillac, picked it up at 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning and totaled it at 10. <laughs> and we all laugh. Huh? <laughs> Told my wife I was going downstairs for a loaf of bread and I ended up in Alaska three months later. We all laugh. Huh? Have you ever wondered what some of those people think? <clears throat> It says that we laugh at sometimes seemingly, seemingly tragic situations. You know what it says after that? Of course you do. Why shouldn't we? Why shouldn't we? Because we have recovered and been given the power to help others. We're so richly blessed, huh? So richly blessed. My life before coming to Alcoholics Anonymous had absolutely no meaning or no purpose whatsoever. None. I was either drunk, planning on getting drunk, recovering from being drunk. I was in trouble, trying to get out of trouble, planning on more trouble. My entire life focused around, I worked all week so I could get drunk all weekend. I worked to get money to drink. And everybody in my life was the same. Alkies don't hang out with social drinkers. So no meaning in my life, no purpose. What's, I'd hear people say simple things like, would you like to go for a walk? I'd say a what? <laughs> Where? <laughs> You want to walk to the liquor store? <laughs> walk. <clears throat> walk where? <laughs> well, Butch, the leaves are changing color. I just thought we'd go for a walk. <laughs> what? <laughs> you go for a walk. We're going for a drink, Carl. <laughs> walk. No meaning, no purpose. I go to that detox, and I go on Sundays as well, because we have a big speaker meeting where I live every Sunday morning, about 300 people. And I like to take new people to speaker meetings. I think it's good for them to listen. I know that's not that fashionable today, but I like to take them. Anyway, I went there one Sunday and got a guy, and he was in bad shape. I mean physically bad. I thought, this guy might die. Well, I figure he can die at the meeting as easy as he can die there. <laughs> so I took him with me. I took him with me. And we went, we took in a nice meeting, and after the meeting, he and I spent a couple hours talking about this deal about this design for living that we have, about this way of life. And I left him. I didn't see him again. I'm sitting in a meeting one day, and I see some guy coming across the hall. I can see he's coming over to me. Clean-cut looking guy, had a pair of slacks on, a shirt, clean haircut. And he walked up to me. He said, Butch, he said, you probably don't remember me. I said, well, I'm sorry. I can't say that I do, but I meet a lot of people. He says, my name's Ziggy. 
I went, holy smokes. Well, that isn't really what I said. <laughs> he said, you remember me? I said, oh, I remember you. It's the guy. It's the guy, right? And he said, Butch, I just wanted to come over and thank you. He said, I haven't had a drink since you took me to that meeting, and it's almost been a year. I said, well, congratulations. He said, I was wondering if I can ask a favor of you. I said, if I can do it. He said, will you come and speak at my one-year AA birthday? I said, I'd be honored to. I went to talk at a deal last Sunday morning. Huh? And I tell you, a big room full of people, Dick, I couldn't get going. I started to cry. I just I couldn't get rolling. I'll tell you why, Carl. I looked out, and there sitting at the front table in a suit and tie, looking like a million bucks, with his wife and all his children, was Ziggy. And he was getting his 15-year medallion. Took him to his first meeting, talked to this one, talked to this five, talked to this ten, talked to this fifteen. You think my life doesn't have meaning? You think my life doesn't have purpose? My life is so rich and so full. That is our purpose, isn't it? That's what we're here for, to be of maximum service to God and those about us. That's what these meetings are for. It's not what they're becoming sometimes, but it's what they're for. Huh? So, Rich, I could sit here for the next two hours talking about the things that have happened in my life. I'd be all alone, but... <laughs> <laughs> but I can but I can do it. <laughs> everything in my life, everything in my life that's good is because of you. Anything that I am or ever hope to be is because of you. Huh? If I lived to be a thousand years old, I could never pay you people back. And you want to know the kicker to this thing? You've never asked me to. You have never asked me for a single solitary thing since the day I have come to Alcoholics Anonymous. You have merely suggested to me, although at times strongly, <laughs> that I try to give a little bit back of what's so freely been given to me. Take a new guy to a couple of meetings, you said. Show him some love and kindness. Maybe give him a hug and tell him he's going to be okay. I don't know how you feel about that, but it seems like a terribly small price for what's been given to me. Huh? Everything that I have is because of you. Can I take two more minutes? Thank you. I'm taking them anyway. Just so <laughs> nice pass. I'm going to just two minutes, so I'll wrap this up. I just want to touch on, on one last thing. My sponsor and I were about as close as, as, close as two human beings can be. I, I, I've heard people in Alcoholics Anonymous say, if you like your sponsor, you've got the wrong sponsor. I hear that, and I know I'm listening to an idiot. <laughs> I don't like my sponsor. I love him. I loved him. And, and my sponsor, uh, he had a, a, a emphysema and, and, and his breathing had got real, real bad and stuff. He was in a wheelchair and on oxygen all the time and stuff. And, and uh, he had to talk at a, at a meeting two hours from our home at a young gal's one-year birthday. Her, her dad is a good friend of ours, 45-year guy in the program. And uh, so, But Bob was in bad. He'd been in the hospital twice that week and stuff. And I phoned him up on the Tuesday. I said, Bob, I said, maybe I should call Cliff and Mary tell him we can't come. You're not, it's been a bad week. I said, they'll understand. He said, oh, no, no, kid. He said, that young lady, she's expecting us. we got to go. I said, okay, I'll come and get you. So I went and I got him and stuff, and I had my Debs, uh, the, what do you call those, SUV trucks, and he's got oxygen tanks, wheelchairs. Ho I got more stuff in that thing than the paramedics got. <laughs> I load him in there, and we drive the two hours to the meeting. We get there. They didn't have any wheelchair stuff, so the boys got him right in the wheelchair and carried him down the stairs. We carried him into the meeting. We got him in the front. We've got hoses coming out of the walls. We've got them all hooked up. And he gave a talk like you wouldn't believe. He gave it all. And at the end, he was done. He was done. And we got all the gear all done, and we got him into the truck, and he and I started driving the two hours home, and, and he was finished. And he looked over at me after a little bit, and he said to me, Kid, he said, I'm awfully glad you were with me tonight. Well, he and I were always together. We went everywhere together for 15 years. And I said, Well, I'm real glad I was with you too, Bob. He said, No, no, kid. I'm really glad you were with me tonight. He said, I think I just gave my last talk. We well, have to understand that my, my sponsor talked at somewhere between 100 and 150 AA meetings a year for 45 years. I said, oh, Bob, I said, you're just tired. You'll feel better tomorrow and stuff. And I got him home, and I got him up into the condo and stuff, and I was going to go. He said, kid, do you have a couple minutes? I said, I have all the time in the world. He said, I just want to look in my journal. And he looked in his journal. He said, it's okay, kid. He said, the, the journal's empty. That's the first time that journal been empty in 45 years. 
And I left. That was June 8th. And the next day I phoned him on June 9th and I talked to him and he sounded a little bit better, but not too good. And on June the 10th, AA's birthday, I phoned him at supper time and I didn't get an answer. And uh, I waited 20 minutes or so and I called back and I still didn't get an answer. And I knew. You know when you know when you don't want to know. And I drove around for two hours because I didn't want to go see what I knew I was going to go see. I just, you know. And I and I went and I picked a young guy up I sponsored. And I said, come on, we got to go to the old guy's place. And I was crying. He said, what's wrong, Butch? I said, the old guy's gone. He said, how do you know? I said, because it's June the 10th and the journal's empty. And we got there and they let us into the condo. And there was that little man that I loved as much as life itself, kneeling beside his bed face down. And he was gone. And it was like somebody unzipped me and took out my heart. I felt an emptiness and a loneliness like I hadn't felt in a long time. And and we were there a long time. The paramedics come and the police come and all that. It was real late and finally they were done and I went home and my Deb was away. She flies and I went home and I was all by myself and, and I sat downstairs and I had a good long cry. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. My life is good. My life is rich and full and will continue to be that way as long as I stay here taking the actions that you tell me to take. But you see, I knew at that moment there was a part of my life that had just changed and was never going to be the same again. And it was a sadness about that uh, for me. And I had a good long cry and I went upstairs and I got beside my bed and knelt down and I thank God for another day of sobriety. You see, my friends, Alcoholics Anonymous works in the good times, and Alcoholics Anonymous works in the hard times. Alcoholics Anonymous works all the time. In those darkest hours, in those most troubled times, when we feel like our heart's going to break in two and we can't go on another foot. When reading 449 isn't going to be enough for you. That's when these men and women will pick you up and they'll carry you through. And the God that we've been introduced to through these 12 steps will carry us on. Huh? I want to thank the committee for the opportunity and privilege of being here with you tonight. I'm looking so forward to the rest of the weekend. I want to thank you people for your kindness and patience. I've talked way, way too long. You know, I don't know what's going to happen from here on in, and none of us know for sure, do we? See, that's called life. Just because we get sober and become members of Alcoholics Anonymous, life doesn't stop happening. People die. Relationships end. Businesses fail. People get sick. Life still goes on. But I'll tell you something. Every single morning for many years now, I say to my friend upstairs, first thing in the morning, I say, if you see fit, I sure would appreciate it if you keep me in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because my dear friends, there's no place in this whole world I'd rather be than right here with you fine, fine people. Thank you and God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.